2 Corinthians chapter 8. Let me kind of set myself up here too. You know, Christmas is the time for remembering the birth of our Savior. Chris, Christmas is the time to reflect on maybe the year that God has blessed us with. It's a time to be around with family, right? All of those things are great. But also, a neat thing about Christmas is that we get to exchange gifts, huh? We were given an ultimate gift from the Father in His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate gift that we were given, and we've been benefactors of that for, for eons, you know? And in that, um, we get to exchange gifts with our family and loved ones and everything like that. How many of you guys have little ones? Okay, okay. and they're excited for Christmas, are they not? Looking forward to the tree, looking forward to the presents. One of the things you'll never have to teach your children, I never had to teach mine, was the word mine. Right? The word mine. They see that present, it's got their name on it, it belongs to them, it is mine. It is mine. Now one of the things that Paul is going to exhort us in today is a viewpoint or a perception on giving. Chapters 8 and 9 are all about giving. The giving of tithes, to be specific. The giving unto the poor, to be specific. In that, there are different types of giving. There's three types. There's, there's the tithe, of which we give unto our home church, or you might tithe an organization, or something of that nature. It's an ongoing, consistent thing that we have committed to and decided in our hearts to pledge unto that work of the Lord. Very important, especially for our local church. The second is an offering. An offering is a time, maybe not a consistent thing, but there might be something that comes your way. You're going to give an offering to a particular work or to a church, or it might be just a one-time thing, or maybe a couple times out of the year or four times out of the year. And then the third way of giving is through alms, A-L-M-S, alms, alms giving. Um, you might have remember phrases like, you know, alms to the poor, okay? Now, what that means is that alms is for the benefit of those who have least, bottom line. Those who have least are benefited by those who have a little more than least. And today, in chapters 8 and 9, we're not going to get into both chapters, we're going to get into the first 15 verses of chapter 8 this morning. As I said, Paul is specifically talking about giving, and he's talking about the heart of giving. He's not talking in the scriptures about a dollar amount. It's not a financial teaching this morning, but it's more teaching on the heart. And in that, that's where we're going to read a little ways between eight and, 1 and 15, where they, those up in the northern part in Macedonia, did not have that attitude of mine. They didn't have that attitude of mine. The Corinthians, according to Paul, needed to come to an understanding about a commitment that they had made a year earlier. How do I know that? Well, in chapter 8, if you look at verse 10, he says, and in this I give advice, it is to your advantage not only to, to be doing what you began and what you were desiring to do a year ago. Okay? So that's one indication that there's been a year lapse in time. If you go to chapter 9 and you look at verse 2, he says, For I know your willingness about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. So when did this year start? Well, turn back in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. It says in verse 1, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches in Galatia, so you must do also. Verse 2 Chapter 16, verse Corinthians. 
On the first day of the week, let each of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever approved by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But it is, if it is fitting that I go also, they will go with me. Paul tells us already in chapter 1, we've studied that, we've looked at that already, that a year prior to this time has gone by, that there was a commitment made, a desire in the hearts of those in Corinth, the believers in Corinth, to bring an offering. Paul had already known about an offering that was needed in a place, and we'll get into that place in a little bit. You see, Paul knew that the churches in Macedonia, or the church in Corinth excelled exceedingly. What did they excel at? What does it mean to excel? Well, just over the top. They were over the top, overly abundant in so many things, specifically the spiritual gifts. And so by this excellence or exceeding, this overflowing in every type of spiritual gift, they, the Corinthians, loved to demonstrate the gifts. They loved to speak in tongues. They loved the quality of teaching. They loved to teach. They loved the, the prophetic words. They operated in the gifts of the Spirit. But Paul knew that they needed to be moved into the spirit of giving. The giving unto a need. The giving unto a work. Paul knew this because he already talked to them a year in advance about this need that arose in a certain place. And yet they had still not received the collection for that need. Paul knows this and so Paul is addressing this and he wants to move them to having a spirit of giving. Paul had a close bond and relationship with those in Macedonia. He had a strong affection with them, and he was close to them. So much so that the Apostle Paul saw them as very giving Christians. He saw them as open-hearted. He saw them as joyous, and he saw them as patient in trials and tribulations, meaning persecutions. He saw them having a zeal to spread the gospel and to share their faith. He also saw those in Macedonia that they had an extreme love for one another and also, as demonstrated, the body of Christ. So Paul here in these two parts of this epistle is reminding those believers in Corinth of their prior commitment to also follow the example of those in Macedonia. Now you might be thinking, where in the heck is Macedonia? Is not Corinth in Macedonia? No, it's not. It's in the southern part of Greece, which is Achaia. I've got a map for you to look at, and it demonstrates and it illustrates for us the three churches, Berea, Philippi, Thessalonica, in the region of Greece, the northern region, which was called Macedonia. The southern region, that southern island, if you will, uh, is Corinth. Now there's a, a, a word just below it, I can't pronounce it, but it's a Roman word in the sense of, it's kind of that Romanesque type of word, and the thing is that things changed when Rome conquered Greece, taking from Alexander the Great, the, that nation, that country of Greece. And so now all of it is under Roman rule. That's the fact of the matter. And the churches in the northern part, in what we call Macedonia at that time, they were hit very hard because Rome went in. They took care of business. They seized property. They took over wealth. They did all of these things. Now, they didn't strip them bare of everything, but enough to where the folks in Macedonia this is, the, this is the turning point of understanding for us, was really a poor region. They were a region, these churches were churches that were filled with people that were impoverished. 
That's why it's so important that we understand the heart of the Apostle Paul to those believers in Corinth. He is saying, look at the example of your brothers and sisters in Macedonia. Compared to you in Corinth, man, they have nothing. They are struggling. They're not nearly close to, in, and you're not even in the ballpark compared to Corinth in the amount of wealth or riches or prestige or prosperity. They're, they're nowhere close because Corinth was a major, major, major city, a port city, much industry, much wealth going on in Corinth. And the church in Corinth was filled with those believers who had converted to Christianity who were very wealthy. And so Paul here is saying, look at your brothers and sisters, please. Look at them. There was a need that was expressed. These folks have gone above, and we'll read it, above and beyond my expectations, says Paul. Not only did they give, but Paul says, and yes, above their ability they gave. Too many times we look at the ability that we have based upon the checking account that we see. That's not what happened to these folks in Macedonia. But they went, Paul says, yea, above their ability to give this amazing gift. Now we're not told of the amount of the, of the, of the gift, but it was enough to where it does require in chapter 9 and later part of chapter 8, it tells us about the accountability that was needed by Paul and Titus and another brother it mentions in the scripture that they needed to have an accountability measure. And the folks in Macedonia and Corinth wanted to assure, ensure the fact that the funds were going to get to the place that they were intended to go. So it was enough, more than enough apparently, to provide the need that was a necessity in this place that they were going. In verses 1 through 5 of 2 Corinthians 8, it says this, Moreover, Paul says, Brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Verse 3. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. Verse 4, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. That's a... Man, that's a circle that, underline that, that particular verse, verse 5. Because that's really the key in these verses. I, I call that section, verses 1 through 5, grace-giving believers. Paul is going to speak of a financial giving as grace. He says it here. In this first part, verses 1 through 5, he says it in verse 6, he says it also in verse 7, and he says it also in verse 9. Notice that Paul considers giving also grace. So important for us, I think, to understand, and I'll get into that later, because of the grace that was given and extended to you and me. God's favor, Paul says, I need to declare to you. He says, moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. He says, I cannot not tell you about God's grace through the people of Macedonia that there's a gift that has been given. I need to kind of boast on them a little bit, he says. I need to kind of... 
as a proud father, in a sense, say, look at what they have done by the grace of God. Not on their own strength, not in their own ability, because they had to go beyond their own ability, but it was all due to the grace of God in their lives, and the grace that God poured over their lives. The word make known means simply to declare. Just to declare or to certify. Paul is saying, I certify because I was there. I've seen their hearts. I've seen the way that they've demonstrated their love. And it also means given to understand, which Paul is making his point. I want you guys to see their example. I want you guys to understand their example for you. Paul says, look at what the Lord is doing in the north. Look at what he is doing amongst the believers, your brothers and sisters in Macedonia. What he's doing is two things, I believe. He's affected their hearts. He's he's poured his grace over them and their hearts have been changed. Their hearts have been affected. By His love and by His grace. And because of that, the second part is their actions then follow suit. They're just not saying it, but they're actually doing it. Very important for a Christian to not just say or commit something to someone or to a church or to a work, but also to say, I'm going to follow through with it. I'm going to actually do what I said I'm going to do. So important with whatever we do, let our yes be yes, and let our no be no. Psalm twenty two twenty two says, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. Paul is saying, I want to make known to you the grace of God that was given to the churches of Macedonia. He's not so much praising the churches, he is, but he's saying, I want to give praise to God. That he just poured down grace upon the churches of Macedonia. How so? It's evidenced by their giving. It's evidenced by their hearts. It's evidenced by their desire to do and follow through with their committed heart. The second part of verse two, or verse 2 then says this, which I would call sacrificial giving. That in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Let's look at that first point. That in great trial and affliction, Paul is drawing a picture for those in Corinth saying, listen, they had a tough time. They were going through some hard times financially, culturally. The Romans were infiltrated. The Romans had rule and they were being affected on all sides. So in times of great trial of affliction, not just great trial, but also persecution. They were afflicted. They were being afflicted upon. That means, in the sense, great affliction means abundant And then, of course, affliction means persecution or trouble. So they had an abundant amount of trouble in their lives. As I said, Greece had been conquered or was under Alexander the Great, yet it had been conquered by Rome, and all their wealth was gone. They were poor, says Paul, but they gave sacrificially. They still gave sacrificially. You know, it's not always how much we give, but the why and the how we give is what matters. Pastor Chuck Smith says, Giving to God can never be measured by the amount. God doesn't measure the gift by the amount. God measures the gift by the cost to the giver. Okay? Giving to God can never be measured by the amount. God doesn't measure the gift by the amount. God measures the gift by the cost to the giver. He further on explains it this way. He says, if you're making a million dollars a year 
and you give God $100,000 in tithes, you're not really giving much. Doesn't really cost you much, he says. Look at all you've got to live on. But if you make $10,000 a year and you give $1,000 to a tithe, that is giving much because you don't have a lot to live on. It's one thing to live on 900000 a year versus 9000 a year, is it not? Quite different. See, everyone was going through tough times in Macedonia, but they shared by God's grace abundantly to people they don't even know. They just know that there's a need. I want you to remember about that story we have in Mark 12, verse 42, about the widow's might. It's also in the Gospel of Luke. But it says in Mark 12, 41, Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. Then one poor widow came and threw her two mites, which is really a fraction of a penny, which make a quadrant, which is a Roman coin. So he called his disciples to himself. He says, let me share something with you guys. Assuredly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty. But in all that she had, her whole livelihood, in other words. See, after this, Jesus brings his disciples, and it says in the scripture that he was seeing how the people put money into the treasury, because it was a very public thing back then. They had these boxes in the temple or outside the temple, and they were called trumpets. These boxes were called trumpets. And what would happen is the people would go and drop their tithe to the temple in these boxes. And some of the people who were very rich were like, look at what I'm giving. Here I go. Is everybody watching? Boink. Man, flesh, huh? Smelly flesh. Jesus was noticing how they were giving. And this poor woman comes and she gives of all that she has. And Jesus said, she put more than everybody else because they took out of their abundance. But she took out of her poverty. See, the Lord's eyes were on that woman that day, that poor woman. Yet she gave more than all the others, even though her offering was the least financially. See, it's not about the money. Paul isn't referring to money. He's referring to your heart. He's referring to the how, not the what. And so it's really important that we understand in the concept of tithing, the concept of giving, is never about the amount of that offering or gift. But it's your heart, it's the how. There's two thoughts that I have on giving. One is, the value of the gift, as we know, is never measured by the amount. Yet the value of the gift instead is measured by the spirit, the how it's been given. If you and I give our tithe as begrudgingly, or we seek to have notice by having a pat on the back, the value of that, regardless of the amount you gave, according to the Lord, just lost all of its value. You just got all of your praise and you just got all of your blessing here. 
The value of that gift is lost, in other words. The second part of verse 2, he says, the abundance of their joy. So, he says that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. So, the abundance of their joy. See, when our tithes are given out of the abundance of our joy, then that is always going to be pleasing to God. It's always going to be pleasing to the Lord. Because those tithes are given as an outpouring or an overflow of our love for the Lord and the desire to do His will. That, that's what it's about. The third part of chapter or verse 2, it says, and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. What Paul is saying really simply is that they gave over the top. Their abundance in how they gave was amazing. In the riches of their liberality. They were rich in giving. Because their hearts desired to give. And again, we don't know the financial gift, but Paul evidently is blown away. Paul is beside himself. So Paul is saying to the church in Corinth, he says, listen, look at them as an example. Look at what they've endured. Look at their persecution. Yet look at what they are giving. And I think for us here today, we are to be like those in Macedonia. We, for this church, are to be the same for those in Macedonia, as in Macedonia. That we are to be those cheerful or hysterical type of givers, joyful type of givers, regardless of the situation that's going on in my life. Paul is saying... Be like the churches in Macedonia, people. Be like them. Charles Spurgeon says this, Giving is true having. As the old gravestone said of the dead man, What I spent, I had. What I saved, I lost. What I gave, I have. You see, everything that you and I give unto the Lord and to His work, we have. It's not giving it away and losing it. Buying a, a coffee someplace, that, that's losing it. You had and you lost whatever that it was to cost for that cup of coffee or that meal. But what you give unto the Lord, it's retained back to you and it's measured back to you. Spurgeon also says, Our gifts are not to be measured by the amount that we contribute, but by the surplus kept in our own hand. I don't know, I, I threw that comment, that, that quote by Gina. She goes, I think you need to understand, maybe uh, uh, clarify that. What, I, what Spurgeon means is, is that if I have $100 and I only give $5, I've got $95 left in my hand. That's what Spurgeon is saying. The amount of your tithe, the amount of your giving is not measured by the five that you gave, but by the 95 that's left in your hand. That's what it's measured by the Lord. You see, the liberality that they experienced means that they gave as if they had a lot. They gave as if they had much, but they didn't have much. They gave liberally because of two things. One is they trusted in God by His grace for their giving and they trusted in God that He would then replenish what they had given. Isn't that always something that goes through our minds, guys? But if I give this, oh, I'm going to be so without it. I won't be able to buy that Christmas present. I won't be able to buy that birthday present. I won't be able to go get a cup of coffee. I won't be able to, to go eat out. I won't go to that movie. All these things. Uh, oh, my goodness. So I'm not going to give that. I'll only give this because I want to 
do this. You see, that, that's, that's not what the Macedonians were doing. They gave because they trusted God in their giving and they trusted God for the replenishing. They trusted God in everything. And I'll, and I'll show you how they trusted God in everything when we get to that verse. In verse 3, Paul sees their love in action. He says, For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing. He says, man, I, their ability was X, but they gave beyond their ability. Why? Because they were freely willing. We have to first be willing. It's like when I do counseling. I always ask the person first, are you willing to make some changes in your life? Are you willing? Are you coming with a mindset that you are willing first? Because what I'm going to share with you, counselor, counseling person, may be difficult for you. It may be hard because it's going to require change. That's the first question I will ask them. Are you willing to make changes? If a person is not willing, Sigmund Freud could be sitting in the room. They aren't going to change. That's how it works. And so, as a result of that, Paul says that they were freely willing. You see, he sees their love in action. He testifies, for I bear witness that they gave above and beyond. In other words, they gave beyond what Paul even thought was possible. Beyond what he thought was even probable for those in Macedonia. But they gave out of their love for Jesus and out of their love for the brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why they gave. They gave because of two things, I believe. One, it was the right thing to do meaning the will of God. It was the will of God that they give. But it was also a good thing to do. Not just a right thing, but a good thing because of the joy of helping. The joy of being a part of something that is bigger than us in supplying this need for these people. Paul didn't even have to prompt them, right? Oh, let me exhort you, bro. Let me encourage you, sister. You know, a little bit of prodding, spiritual prodding, which sometimes is more the gift of manipulation, right, versus exhortation. And so Paul didn't have to do any of that. He didn't have to lay a guilt trip on them or anything. They were already freely willing they had already had their minds made up and their hearts were followed in line with that. They were set apart, in other words, already in their hearts to give. Charles Spurgeon says this, We want personal consecration. I have heard the word pronounced purse and all consecration. A most excellent pronunciation, certainly, he says. He who loves Jesus consecrates to him, being Jesus, all that he has and feels it a delight that he may lay anything at the feet of him who laid down his life for us. Purse and all. Consecration. In other words, all. Not just a portion. Not just a piece. Not just a part. But all is to be laid down. For Jesus Christ. Because of all that God laid down. For you and for me. All of it. He, God held nothing back from you. Did he? Did God hold anything back? Did he give you salvation with strings? Did he give you partial salvation? If you do this or if you do that. Then you'll have 100% salvation. No. He paid the ultimate cost. By, bringing his, by having his son crucified for you and me. With nothing held back. No strings attached, guys. All of it on our behalf. In verse 4, 
He says they were imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. <laughs> they were insistent. You know how it is. You might see someone who may not have much. I tell you, I have seen it so much on mission trips that I've gone to. Maybe some of you have too. When we were in Nepal and these people who live in these little dwellings with dirt floors, um, they're sitting on something. You go to talk to them and they get up from their seat to give it to you. Or they make you food that you know that maybe is the only meal they've had for the day or they're going to have for that day and yet they want you to, to, to be a part of that. And you know, you know, you know full well you're taking, a, you're taking that portion from them and their family. You know that full well. And you feel bad about it. And you're like going, no, no, time out, time out. I, 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 you know, no, it's okay. I don't, I've got a backpack full of granola bars. I'm good. You know, let me give you some of my granola bars, please. All of these things. And it's like, man, uh, but, you, but they're insistent. They implore you to be blessed. That's what it's all about. That's why I love missions trips. That's why you go on missions trips, to see those who have least, who then have that heart like the Macedonians to give the most of their ability and yea, beyond their ability. That's, that's why we go. That's why we see and we come back and we're just so excited and motivated to know, you know what, we are the richest nation in this world. If you have a TV and you live in four walls and you've got a vehicle, you are super rich compared to the world. The majority of the world is all third world. We are a super rich nation. And you are benefactors of this wealth in this country. You are rich. How many of you here that are youth have a cell phone? Raise your hand. You are stinking rich, man. You are filthy rich. That, that's, that's the point, you see. And you go to another place and you're like, man, they have nothing. And yet they want to give so much to us. And you feel like this big. But they implore us. That's what the people in Macedonia were doing. They were saying, we implore, we want, we're begging you to take this gift. We don't want to take no for an answer. Paul had seen their poverty. Paul had seen what their tribulations were about, the persecutions were about. He saw all of that and he said, no, <laughs> you guys give what you can. They go, no, we want to give above and beyond what we think we can give. That's what we want to do. Because our hearts tell us so. And the will of God requires it of us to do that. That's why we do this. That's why we want to give. Now the place. Who are they giving to? Understand, these are Greeks. They're Grecians. They're Gentiles who have come to Christianity. Back in the book of Acts, there was a time to where the church had formed and then everyone gave of all of their property and wealth unto this new church plant that was going on in Jerusalem. Well, after a amount of time, those funds and because of persecution and the Roman rule in Jerusalem, things had been stripped away. There was a famine that had gone on as well. And the, the believers, the brothers and sisters in Jerusalem, like that church, the first church, right? of Christianity were in dire straits. They needed help. But they're all Jews. They're all Jews. Think about it. These Macedonians and these Corinthians, ultimately, Gentiles are going to give abundantly to their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. They need their help. They need their assistance. And they're like, you can count on us because they're our brothers and sisters. You can count on us because you've told us they have a need and we want to be a supplier of that need in some way. When it says to us in the word, in verse 4, 
the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. That word fellowship means koinonia. That's the word that's used, koinonia. And if you've been a Christian long enough, or if you read your Bibles long enough, you're gonna, you do a study on things, you're, you hear pastors speak, they speak about this word koinonia. And it's a Greek word, meaning oneness, singularity, unity, koinonia. And so Paul is saying this, he says, listen, they implored us, us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship, the oneness of the ministering to the saints. You see, they felt connected to the saints in Jerusalem by their giving to the saints in Jerusalem. Do you follow me? Yeah, everybody, amen? All right, cool. Guys in the back, they do. Yes. <laughs> They're tracking. You see, they wanted and they knew that by the giving of this financial gift that they would some way be connected to the people in Jerusalem. That they would know in Jerusalem that they are loved by, in Macedonia, in Corinth. And that real Christianity doesn't have the borders or the, or the, the, the property lines or the county lines or the city lines or the nation, national lines of countries. It has nothing to do with that. Christianity spreads, is to be spread all over the world in whatever way we can do that. And if that means through your financial giving, then so be it. Then so be it. Let that be your part. Since you can't go to Nepal, let that be your part in order to be a part of the saints in Nepal or wherever. So Paul sees this amazing work in action and their insistence to give. I think Pastor John Corson said it way better than I can say it. He said it this way about this verse. He says that the fellowship of ministering comes many times from our financial giving. Maybe because it's often through the pocketbook. As our money is a represent representation of our time and energy. So what he means by that is this. How many of you guys work 8 to 5, 40 hours a week? Show me your hand. Okay, maybe you work 9 to 5, 40 hours? How many of you guys work a regular work week? You know, 40 hours. All right, cool, 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 cool. Whatever that, wow, a lot of you don't work, do you? Praise the Lord. All right. I love it. Got a church where people don't even work. We're going to teach this message one more time. God wants you to give out of your poverty. Kidding. You guys walked into that one. You walked into that one. Okay, we work a job, right? And we work 40 hours a week for some rate of pay. And we get a paycheck at the end of the week. Guess what? That 40 hours was a part of your life for that week. Part of your life is represented in that paycheck. Amen? We know that, right? So now, the offering plate is passed around. Or now there's a need. And you're like, man... I just worked a part of my life. 40 hours. My life. I just worked. So, oh man. My life is important to me. I'm just not going to give my life away or part of my life away that easily. I'll give one hour of my life to the church. In tithe. Or I'll only give two. You see... That's what Pastor John is talking about. He also says that maybe that's why it's hard for people to tithe. Because they don't want to give part of their life away. They don't want to. Remember, we began, mine, mine. R. Kent Hughes, commentator, says, it's been said that as people have an open heart, they most likely will have an open hand. 
The example of the Macedonians is a practical proof of the true generosity is not the prerogative of those who enjoy an adequacy of means. The most genuine liberality is frequently displayed by those who have least to give. Christian giving is, is estimated in terms not of quantity but of sacrifice. Do you see the, the thread here? It's not about giving out of our abundance. That's easy. But it's when it costs you something. That's when it means something to you. This is how it happens. Verse 5. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Do you see the order? You and I have to first give ourselves completely to God. They gave more than they expected. And Paul says it in their giving. He knew they'd given so much. Why? How did they do it? First, they gave themselves to God. Then, secondly, they gave themselves over to the will of God. So in giving themselves first to God, this means that they were 100% given over to the Lord in everything. Lord, my finances are yours. Lord, my health is yours. Lord, my family is yours. Lord, my material things are yours. Everything is yours, God, and I'm going to use them for your glory. That's the first step. Relinquishing all that God has given you already by His grace and relinquishing all of it to the cross and saying, Lord, it is all of yours anyway. You need this, so be it. You require this, so be it. I'm to come in to help in this area this way, so be it. That, that, that's what we're talking about. That's what Paul is talking about. 100% given over to the Lord. This means that those in Macedonia already knew that they, what they had already belonged to God anyway. They didn't have the, the I, me, mine mentality of their material goods or their finances. This means they had already given all of themselves. This also meant all that they had. I tell you what, man. It's freeing when you don't hold on to things. It's freeing when you can give unto the Lord with an open heart and not counting, but just giving. So many of us are prone to count the jot and tittle in our giving to God. Oh, I can't ever go over the 10%. I can't ever go below the 10%. Really? What if God wants you to give more than 10%? What are you going to do? Is that an area of prayer? Is that an area of struggle? It shouldn't be. Because all that you have already is God's. And if you reconcile in your heart and mind that God, you have given me this on loan. <laughs> it's all yours, so I'm going to give it back. For this purpose or that purpose. It's kind of like 1 Corinthians 13 in the way that we do this, the how. We can do so many things, but 1 Corinthians 13 says if you don't have love, you're just a no noisy, clanging symbol. You see, and if you and I give in the sense of wanting the attention to ourselves or giving begrudgingly or counting every gnat's eye, then it's no good to God. I mean, I really believe that. God wants us to be cheerful givers. Hysterical givers is a translation. And in that hystericalness, it's like, I just want to give back what's God's. I just want to give it to Him. Then secondly, to the work of God by the will of God. 
So when we understand and we give ourselves to the Lord, then we give him all we have to be used and given to him according to his will. Well, we're going to stop there today. Didn't quite get to my 15 verses. Almost. Didn't quite make it, though. So we're going to finish up next week to infinity and beyond and, and finish up this thing. But, you know, we're, we're heading into the Christmas season, right? Man, it seems like my email gets flooded from all the different Christian organizations and other organizations that are like, you know, hey, remember this, remember that, remember this. And it's like, what do we do? Delete, 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 right? Well, you know what? Those are all worthy things and good things. But I want us, this season, this Christmas season, that it would be your heart to have a transformation. That it would be your mind to have a, a realization that when either we from the pulpit or in conversations outside the pulpit talk about tithes or offerings, that it's not the money is the issue, but it's our heart. It's not in the what that we give, but in the how that we give. That's most important. We'll pick up next week. Good stuff next week, so be with us. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time, and I thank you, God, for this portion of Scripture. Lord, I pray that you would help us start thinking as we just touch the tip of the iceberg, Lord, in this, that you would move already in our hearts, God, that you would allow us to be purposed in our giving, directed in our giving, Lord, and that we would be joyful in our giving. And that we would not so much look at what we've given, but what we have left over is the indicator. And that God, that even as this church has needs, that there are other organizations that may have needs as well, Lord, that we would be like those in Macedonia, that we would truly not because of ourselves, but solely by your grace, be those grace givers. We thank you, Lord, for this time. Bless those that are here, God. May they grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name.